Now, I'm very happy to say that we have Niall Moyner from DCU with us. Niall, you're very welcome as ever. The rationale behind asking you on was twofold. One, we're having a series across the week on grassroots sport in Ireland, on the future of sport in Ireland. And secondly, and connected to that, I was watching Operation Transformation the other evening and I thought it was very interesting when you made the point that here in Ireland we have no standardised fitness test as such and you had devised one for the show. And I thought, well, that is interesting and I'd be curious to know the markers you have devised. So uh, let's start with that and then we'll get into a broad chat on Irish fitness and where we are. Uh, this fitness test then, obviously the demands change according to age and gender. Yeah, well, first of all, thanks a million for having me on, Joe. Great to be with you again. Yeah, I mean, it's... The question I'm always asked by the average punter on the street is, how fit do I need to be? You know, that's the question, you know. And I always say, well, do you want to run in the Olympics or do you want to be healthy? Because they're two entirely different constructs. And unfortunately, from a societal perspective, the vast majority of people don't play sport, obviously, particularly after the age of 30. But they have this notion that you have to be like an, a trained athlete to get any health benefits. That's the level of fitness you have to attain when in fact the fitness that we need for health is a, a totally different construct. And basically, obviously, sports-related fitness is related to your ability to play whatever s sport it is and to be able to maximize your performance during competition. Whereas health-related fitness, it's related to your ability just to, to perform activities of daily living walking up a flight of stairs, going to the bathroom, taking in the groceries. And it's related to both your current and your future health. And there are four components that are really important to optimize your health-related fitness. And, and those four are an ideal body composition. So you're not carrying excess body fat or excess weight, particularly in the midsection. The second one is cardiovascular fitness. It's the one that most people think of as fitness. Well, you know, how far, how hard can I run? The third one then is balance because as we age, we have something called proprioception and we tend to lose that. So our ability to balance, it, 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 it disimproves as we age and it's a big, big risk for falls. And you know, when you're, when you're 14, 15, 20 year old, that's a million years away, but believe you me, it creeps up pretty rapidly. And then the last one, which is very underappreciated, both in men and women, but particularly women, is muscular strength and endurance. Mm. So give us a sense of the fitness test you devised then and some of the markers. Well, I, I wish I could take credit for devising. I'm not that smart. So what, what, what I did was we looked at uh, tests that had been done throughout the world. And these are validated tests. That's the first thing. They're valid. So they're measuring what they're supposed to measure. And they're also reliable. So if you measure a person today and you measure a person tomorrow, you should get the same results. So that's very, very important. And these tests have been done on thousands of people throughout the world over the last 30 to 40 years. And obviously, as we age, uh, our levels of fitness decrease. That's a natural consequence of aging. Even if we exercise every day, our fitness levels will deteriorate with aging. And women, for the most part, don't attain the same levels of muscular strength and endurance and cardiovascular fitness. So therefore, it would be unfair to have the same criteria for women. So therefore... Uh, there's a sliding rule. As you age, the number you have to attain to meet the minimum standard decreases, and there's also a, low, a lower number for women than men. Yeah, so give me some specifics. I'm curious, because what caught my ear, for instance, watching the other evening uh, was men in your 30s. I think, from memory, it was 16 push-ups is something that you should be aiming for. And I thought, oh, th these are interesting things uh, to know or to have an idea of, because people can do a Joe Wicks hit session, and they might be managing seven press-ups in their 30 seconds, or they might be managing double that. And it's hard to know how fit you are. It's hard to know what's a good pitch to be at for your age. So you might give us some ballpark numbers like that or ballpark areas you think we should be cognizant of. Well, well you know, obviously, you know, you're going to have... Well, first of all, I think that's a very... It's, it's important. People love to know. That's why they love coming into our lab. Tell me where I am. Yeah. Where do I compare against someone my age? Or if I'm 40, how, how do I compare to a 20-year-old? People love that. So obviously, there's going to be a, a wide range. It depends just your, your gender and your fitness. And, and I, think that, I, I think it's important that people don't get too caught up in the actual numbers. Ideally, you'd like to meet the minimum. Uh, and one of the things that we find is that the vast majority of people in Ireland would fail to meet the minimum standards in at least two to four of those tests. Now, over, over the age of 60, it's much, much higher than that. So 
obviously th th there was a research paper studied in America looking at firefighters but two years ago and they found that if you were a fire if you were a, a male and you could do more than I think it was 40 I'm not 100 percent maybe it was th between 30 and 40 push-ups you had a 95 percent reduced risk of developing heart disease because that was a great it, it, it tells you that if you can do 30 push-ups you have pretty good functional capacity you're not aging you're not you're not going to become frail very very quickly so that's why these tests are important they can give people that wake-up call now, a lot of people will, will email me and said i had no idea that i was so unfit you know i go for a walk every day well that's good that's your cardiovascular fitness but then you ask the same lady to do a push-up you know and she and i think she told me she could do three push-ups and at, for her age she should have been able to do 15. yes well can you give me some numbers then let's shock a few people have you got them in front of you i actually don't have the numbers but i can okay. get them very quickly for you okay i just get them now here do if you're just tuning in we're talking to professor niall moyna and it's as part of our grassroots in sport series that we're running all week it's about grassroots sport in ireland participation numbers about the future of sport and what i'm nagging and uh, nile to get here are uh, some numbers that he threw to people on operation transformation uh, recently whereby there are certain minimum markers we should all be trying to hit you know be it uh, in terms of cardiovascular or as niall says or strength when it comes to things like uh, push-ups so so we have located the information we have nag niall to get the information so niall uh tell us give us a scare us give us a sense of the numbers give us a sense of some of the markers you know we should be aiming to hit well you know the numbers i'm giving is the average so if you're below this number you're below average so the higher the more the higher you are above it that's great for you so if you're a 30 year old male you should be able to do a minimum of 21 normal push-ups and most 30 year olds would find that pretty difficult after 15 they're sucking diesel you'll find the vast majority and for a female and the women do it the females do it with their knees on the ground men must do the normal push-ups uh, and obviously when you get to 40 year old it's 16 50 year old it's 12 and that may seem very easy but you know when you go home tonight Go down and try and do, if you're under 30 years of age, in fact, if you're under 20 years of age, it's 30 push-ups. So is that, is that the same number for male and female, but female do it with their knees on the no, ground? No, females, for a 30-year-old female, a 30-year-old male would be required to do 21 normal push-ups, whereas a 30-year-old female has to do 14 modified push-ups. Because okay. remember, women have much, much lower muscle strength than men, so you wouldn't expect them to attain the same value. Mm. It drops off quite a bit with each decade, doesn't it? Not that that'll be breaking news to a lot of listeners. <laughs> well, you know, unfortunately, Joe, you know, we all, primary aging starts around the age of 30. So regardless of our nutrition or our exercise habits, we are going to lose muscle mass. But the rate at which we lose it can be affected by our lifestyle. So if, if we don't maintain muscle mass, and a great example is when we're young, and we're playing lots of sports, we use our fast twitch fibers every time we're sprinting. I mean, think about it, after you retire from, from competitive sports, you probably never sprint again. So those fast twitch fibers, if they're not used, what happens is they, 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 they become dislodged from the nerves, so therefore you can't use them anymore. If you can't use them, they just atrophy and they waste away, and you can't get them back. So it's very, very important after the age of 30, and particularly in young women. Young women really don't appreciate this. One of the others, and the reason we designed these tests, Joe, was they had to be simple, and you had to be able to do them at home. Mm -hmm. So another very simple test was to sit on a chair, a regular chair with your arms across your chest on your shoulders, and to, to sit, to, to be able to, to, to uh, stand and sit as many times as you, as you possibly could in 30 seconds. So again, for a 30-year-old male, they would be expected to do 24 of those in 30 seconds. And a female 30-year-old, 23. And again, as you, as you get older, a 40-year-old male, two less, it would be 22. And a 40-year-old female, two less, it would be 21. But, you know, it, it's amazing mm. the number of people that get to the age of 40, 45, 50, and all of a sudden you ask them to do these tests and they just say, I just did not realize what has happened. Yes, and to give us a sense of how rapidly we go downhill and not to be ageist as well, if there's a 60-year-old out there wondering about that chair exercise, what should they be aiming at? A 60-year-old male would be 18. Okay. So up and down 18 times in 30 seconds. If you're a female, 17 times. And believe it or not, we lose the strength in our lower body 
faster than we do in our upper body. So maintaining that lower body, and as I as I did an, an operation transformation last year, I got people to get up off a chair without using their hands. It's amazing. We just start to, as we age, it means that if you're using your hands to get up from a chair, it means you're compensating for a lack of muscle mass or a lack of strength. Because when you were 8, 9, 10, 13, 14, you jumped out of the chair. Yes. <laughs> so, so we're compensating. Niall, I'm starting to grunt as I get out of chairs at this age. So any other exercises then? That's very interesting. The push-ups, getting out of the chair, any yeah. cardiovascular ones? Yeah, well, the other one then obviously is, is your, your waist, your height. So you take your height, so your, your, you measure your height and your waist circumference. And if your waist circumference is more than half of your height, you're in trouble. And what metrics are we using here? Inches, centimeters? E either are. Okay, it applies either to are. both. Either are. That, that's clearly indicating. And the worst place, and we see it a lot, particularly men and women, but more so in men, this increased uh, uh, body weight, but particularly around the midsection, because that results in an array of metabolic diseases. It increases your risk, obviously, for diabetes, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease. So that's the worst place. And but unfortunately, these are the people who COVID-19 absolutely love. You yes, know, okay. The virus loves people who have metabolic diseases, and that's that waist to height ratio is a really, is a, you know, is, is, is a good yardstick to where you currently rank. Yeah, because I mentioned you were coming on last night, funny enough, and the BMI was roundly uh, slammed by listeners and some of us alike, but the uh, weight, or sorry, the waist uh, size to height one is, that's a, that's a good indicator then, that's something people can check. Yeah, yeah, look, BMI is wonderful for large epidemiological studies, but, you know, on a, on a one-off, and I mean, according to BMI, I'm close to the overweight category, yeah. you know, because of muscle mass and everything else. So it, it, it has its drawbacks. And then the other one is balance. Balance one was very, very simple. And I think a, a, from what I've heard, the feedback I've got, a lot of people at home got fun out of doing this. So this is basically standing on one leg, again, with your arms crossed. But what you have to do is close your eyes. Because once you close your eyes, you lose your sense of where you are in time and space. And then you find how long you can stand on one leg, but you can't shuffle around on the leg that's stationary. You have to stand dead straight. And again, you know, that's one of the fitness components that really deteriorates very, very rapidly as we age. Mm. For a 30-year-old, you should be able to, and you're a male, you should be able to hold that balance for a minimum of eight seconds. Now, remember all these numbers that I'm giving. This is the average. You know, in an ideal world, you'd like to be in the top 25%. So add 25% all to the numbers that I'm giving you. That's the ideal scenario. This is the minimum because if you're below these numbers, then you're below the minimum, you know, the threshold, the average threshold, and mm. it means that you have work to do. For balance for a 30-year-old woman, again, it's, it's eight seconds. It's pretty much the same for men and women. You should be able to hold that balance. Uh, and that requires, as we age, we should be doing exercises. Like there are different exercises that we can do yes. to maintain our balance as we age. Well, I'll ask you about them in a moment. And so for a 60-year-old male and female, when it comes to their balance? Well, for uh, five seconds. Five, okay. To be able to hold that. Now, oddly enough, you know, when we would do this cold turkey on people, the first one or two times they would do it, because when you're out walking, and all of a sudden you hit a curb and your balance, you can't repeat it, that, you know, you can't, oh, I'll come back and I'll try again. <laughs> you know, you're down and that's it. So for the vast majority of people that we did, they were back on their feet within two seconds. So it's really frightening how quickly we lose our balance. Uh, and we, and uh, because we don't do those simple exercises that allow us to maintain our balance, like that test, if you were to do that balance just at home practicing that, it's amazing within three weeks, you, you'll probably get a 50% improvement. Is that right? Yeah. Because, it's, I mean, it's such a terrible thing. And there's a cruelty, isn't there, in the fact that older people are more susceptible, it seems, to having falls, and they're the ones who will be most damaged by those falls. So it's really important to anybody, you know, who's anybody and as an elder in their life, uh, you worry about getting that phone call saying, well, look, there's been a fall. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know, falls in the elderly is one of the, is one of the big, big, biggest issues that we have. And uh, along with balance, strength is the, is the other big thing, because when you do fall... If you have that muscular strength to be able to, to to hold your weight as you're falling, and unfortunately for a lot of elderly individuals, it's a primary reason for hospitalizations is, mm. is, is, is is falls. A lot of complications then from surgery due to, from surgery due to falls. Where should we be then when it comes to cardiovascular? 
I mean, don't don't inflict a bloody bleep test on us now. I'll give us something a bit more. No, I, I I think people, <laughs> people people are bleeped out at this stage. This is a really nice test. It's called the twelve minute run walk test. So what you do is, what's the maximal distance you can cover in twelve minutes? It can be jogging entirely, it can be walking entirely, or it can be a combination of jog, run, walk, whatever you want. So it's entirely up to the individual. And that's a really good, because that measures our cardiovascular fitness. And of all the fitness indices that we measure, this is probably the best predictor of both your current and your future health. Right. So if I was to take you into the lab and put a mouthpiece and you would sit there for 10 minutes and I put a mouthpiece and measured how much oxygen you were consuming. You'd consume around 3.5 milliliters for every kilogram. We refer to that as one met. That's your resting oxygen uptake. At a minimum, every single person up to the age of 60, 70, at maximal exercise should be able to consume oxygen at 10 times their resting level. That's 35. That's the yardstick I always say. If you're above 35, the likelihood of you developing a chronic disease in the next five years or so is reduced dramatically. Okay. So that's a big, big number. So the, the distances, you know, we'll, we'll start with females this time. So it's around 2,000 meters if you're a 30-year-old female. And that, by, the t- by 60 years of age, it's around 1,800 meters. In, tw- in 12 minutes? Yeah. Okay. So that's a brisk walk or a jog. Now, you probably will not be able to cover it unless you can, part of it would involve jogging. And there are people who have musculoskeletal issues that, you know, does not allow them to jog. So this is ideally it presumes that you're going to do a combination of walking and jogging. For a guy around 2,400 meters if you're 30 years of age. Okay, so 2.4K in 12 minutes. Yeah, yeah. which is okay. it's certainly doable. Yeah. Certainly doable. But you would find... For 30-year-olds in Ireland, you probably 30% would not be able to attain that currently, mm. believe it or not. Mm. And uh, what about the 60-year-old uh, male in 12 minutes? Uh, 2,000. Okay, so a flat 2K, 2K. go. Flat yeah. 2K, well, it's 2,076, but 2K roughly uh, in 12 minutes. So that's six minutes per K. Mm. And now with our phones and we have all of the GPS on our phones, it's so easy to measure. So now people have a yardstick. So here are the key components. And the nice thing about this, you could be very strong on two and weak on the other two. So the focus is, okay, maintain where you are, but really put a little bit of extra work into the ones where you're weak, or it may only be one. So that's the nice thing about this, is that you can see where your weaknesses are from from a health perspective. Yes. Well, funny, I've said that to my parents a few times, like they're both very active and you know, between, between tennis and walking and all this stuff. But I don't think weight training would feature in a big way. And we all underestimate the weight training as we get older. We think that's for young bucks who want to look good in front of a mirror. You you know, (laughs) I wish we could get that message out, particularly young girls. Okay. Because, you know, if we start primary aging around the age of 30, we start to lose muscle mass. Remember, by the age of 30, men will have deposited a lot more muscle into the muscle bank than women. So women are starting to lose it from a much lower base. So the likelihood is they will reach frailty much earlier than men and we know that the women do and part of the reason a large part of the reason is that they lose this muscle mass after 30. Mm. so uh, when i give give talks to the public i really drive home the pine now the men you can turn off for this if you want it's the women i want to switch on but also for men as well after the age of 60 particularly 70 we really see a large decrease in men but if you have maintained throughout your life you've done maybe two days a week of some form of resistance training the likelihood is even at 70 years of age you're going to have a much higher level of muscle compared to another 70-year-old. You're, again, you're starting much higher, but very, very important for women. And so say, say there's a, a 40-year-old woman listening and this is kind of a bit of a wake-up call and she's active and she does her, you know, whatever kind of aerobic sport it might be, but weights has just been something, not her bag. Uh, maybe she was told at a younger age, so that's, that's, you know, men are off doing weights or the weights room was an intimidating place. What should a 40-year-old woman starting from base, you know, a, a low base be looking at because obviously you know the weights can have the um you know the image of arnold schwarzenegger and lifting big heavy things and 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 i don't think it's quite about that not at all i mean for most people men and women starting from a low base you just start with simple weight bearing exercises push-ups push-ups against a wall you know step ups on the stairs uh, simple lunges at home without weights because it would take six to eight weeks but joe you 
will be amazed at how quickly strength levels improve. Yes. You would be absolutely amazed. And those who have the lowest level of strength, they're going to get much, much bigger increases very, very quickly. They get more bank for their buck. And I, I can't emphasize that enough. And now's the time to start in your 30s. If you haven't lifted before this, and again, it comes back to my whole issue about why are we not teaching young kids in secondary school and in primary school, weight-bearing exercises, teach them how to develop a resistance program. So when they walk into a gym, it doesn't feel alien. Oh yeah, I've done this before. This is pretty yeah. easy. That's what I believe we should be teaching, these health-related skills that we take with us for the rest of our lives. Mm. It's all fascinating, I have to say. Um, to go a uh, big picture then, so uh, kids, teens, adults, if I start with kids initially and get your sense of where we are, I mean, I was at the ESRI study in 2013, I think it was, it was a massive study, 70,000 people, Dr. Pete Lund was there, and certainly uh, at that stage, I don't know to what extent the picture has changed, but at that stage there was uh, you know, a fair degree of happiness that all primary school kids were engaged in a fair amount of activity. And then second level, as people might no, anecdotally, is when the drop-off happened, especially girls. So, for instance, um, well, actually, I'll come to drop-off in a second. If we start with primary school, uh, the most recent information I looked at was that one in every five Irish primary school children are overweight or obese, and apparently that's an improvement. And you know, let's you know, because these things are often doomsday. So this seems to be an improvement. So one in every five Irish primary school children overweight or obese. What, what do you want to say about the kids? I, I think there's a few things. I, I think we, we have spent too much time scaring people. Uh, things are not as bad. Now, the problem with a lot of these surveys, you're going out and you're asking kids to fill in a questionnaire. And there's a huge issue with that. Because if you look at the current most recent report, according to that, only 10% of Irish kids between the ages of 10 and 18 meet the minimum recommended daily dose of physical activity, which is 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity activity. Okay. That's basically what the questionnaire data is telling us. So kids should be doing an hour every day and only one in 10 are getting that? Correct. Between okay. the ages of 10 and 18. Do you know a point on that as well? Um, so I was lucky enough to grow up in a, in a generation where helicopter parenting wasn't as um, prevalent as it is now. Now, <laughs> I'll be a helicopter parent, don't worry. And the digital revolution hadn't taken hold. So I played on the streets. And we, you know, I, 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 from memory, weekends, you're pretty much out the whole time. You're doing whatever. There was a rollerblading phase. There's football constantly. There's climbing trees. There's tip the can. There's a million different pursuits. And UCC had a very interesting study recently where they said that skills... Uh, generally mastered by six-year-olds, and we're talking all of the uh, stuff I've just referenced, jumping, throwing, catching, hitting, you know, we played rounders, all of this stuff. So UCC looked at um, a bunch of uh, 12 or 13-year-olds, and a lot of them aren't able to do what the six-year-olds should be able to do. And so that comes back to this whole area of play, play on the streets. That's a, that's a social change. Um, but like, I, I don't know if the advice, uh, just send your kids out and, and, you know, we did it in my day, out you go is going to really work with parents today. So, you know, when we're trying to get kids active and that one hour a day, I, that's now going to fall on the schools increasingly, isn't it? It is. Well, we have to go back, I suppose, even I'm older than you. So I'm a product, mm. I grew up in the 60s uh, yeah. when probably we were the only house in the village or maybe two others with a TV and all black and white. And when you had to change the channel, you had to get up your backside. And uh, although we only got UTV up in Monaghan, we didn't get RTE at the time. Uh, you had one station. So life was about unstructured play. It was, but you know, we, we had a front, we had a wall in the front of our house in the middle of the village and right in the center of the village. And we, you threw a, a goals on the wall and you spent hours upon hours out on the front street. And that was unstructured play. And, you know, it, it was a wonderful time. Times have changed. And wh whether we like it or not, the genie is out of the box. Yes. Because kids today live in a digital era. Yeah. And this thing about take away their phones, I mean, the phone is an extension of them. You know, it, it's like the end of the world to take a phone away from a kid. It's part of who they are now. So I think we have to teach kids to live along with this technology. Because remember, prior to the Industrial Revolution, which isn't that long ago, we spent most of our time hunting and foraging for food. We were physically active all day. Mm. So our genes over 4 million years have evolved for us to be physically active. And when we're not physically active, it is amazing how quickly those genes maladapt and we develop diseases. Right. And people have this perceived notion, well, they're only kids, they're, they're okay, they're fine. Most of the chronic diseases that afflict mo the modern society, their genesis are in childhood. Right. 
And the I, longer I, I, I suspect the overweight or even obese kid doesn't tend to turn that around. No, I, I think, and I, I'm glad you brought that up because my concern, believe it or not, I believe, and this is a hunch of mine, uh, we have ran a school's fitness challenge for the last 10 years. So we've collected data, a bleep test on 213,000 kids wow. over a 10 year period. So it's a pretty wow. large study. Okay. And, and But it's only in one of those four components. It's only in cardiovascular fitness. We haven't measured their strength. It was something that we're hoping to do in the future is to take those four fitness components. But my concern is I think the top 75%, they're pretty okay. Right. I think the bottom 25% are falling off a cliff. A falling off a cliff. And I think they're going, they're going to be, the, 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 probably that bottom even 20% will result in probably 90% of healthcare spending in 50 years, 60 years. It's so just that's a, that's, that's those individuals, bomb. because they're, they're overweight, they're inactive, you know, and it's very, very hard to get them engaged in even in play and in fun activities. And have you be, been able to identify the reasons as to why they are headed for that cliff? I mean, socioeconomic issues have to come into play, I presume. Yeah, I mean, we, we, even... We have preliminary data uh, in, our, in that school's fitness challenge that shows that if you are a, a boy or a girl, but particularly a girl, and you go to a fee-paying school, you're much more likely to meet the minimum fitness requirements for optimal cardiovascular health compared okay. to a kid who goes to a desk school. Okay. So we know that the, you know, the social inequalities are there. To be fair, the Irish government, we, we really try hard you know, to decrease that level of inequality. It is a difficult. There's yeah. intergenerational issues that are very, very difficult to break, but I think we're very aware of them. Teachers are aware of them. Schools are aware, are aware of them, but it is a difficult. And we're living more and more in urban, in urban areas mm. and safety and access to, to safe environments is becoming an issue. You know, being, being honest, Joe, and I'm not wearing my GEA hat here, but can you imagine what the infrastructure in this country, the sporting infrastructure in Ireland would be like if the GA hadn't, hadn't have existed? Mm. We've only started to spend money on sporting infrastructure in the last quarter of a century. Yeah. Prior to that, the government spent nothing. You know, it was left to the device of, of, of the local clubs or whatever the case may be. So we failed for 100 years and we started, we started probably when it was too late. Mm. And I think I would like to see an awful lot more municipal facilities that every sport can use. It's not GA specific, it's not soccer, it's not rugby. You build these facilities, in our, particularly in our towns and our urban areas, that all kids get access to, regardless of what sport that you actually play. Mm, okay. So let's get into adolescence then. And I, we'll leave behind the kids. And again, one in 10 from memory, you said there are getting their one hour of daily activity. Well, sorry, sorry, Joe, could, could yeah. I just state something before you go on? Yes, I sp do. spoke to Mick Bohan, who is a PE teacher, and everyone would know Mick, he's coached the women Dublin's football team. Yeah. And he's been teaching PE now for up to 30 plus years. And his biggest issue at the moment, and it goes back to the Cork study, is that the kids coming into secondary school don't have the basic fundamental motor skills to engage in physical education. Okay. So that's analogous to a kid coming into secondary school and not doing basic arithmetic and then asking them to do algebra in first year. It just okay. won't happen. Or to teach, okay. you know, the, the, the reading, writing and arithmetic. So we have a huge problem and I think we need to spend, before you go on from the primary school, I think we need to take a hard look and the ASTI are totally opposed to this. We've got to get to grips with the 20, we're living in the 21st century. We need to put, there's nothing more important to a child in national school, I don't care what anyone tells me, than their health. And we're neglecting it. And we need to spend, send qualified physical education teachers into our primary schools. And it could be one teacher for every three schools. And they could be able to, in addition to providing classes, could also upskill the teachers that are currently there. But left to the devices of teachers who have an interest in activity or sport, that is simply not good enough. Okay. So at the moment, you're too much at the uh, whim of a given teacher and you hope they're into their sport and they do a good job as a PE teacher, but you could be unlucky in that regard. Correct. Yeah. Correct. That, would be, that would have been my school experience. Some years good, some years not so good. Yeah. And therefore, we're producing 12 and 13 year olds who arrive into McBowen's class. And when it comes to basic motor skills, jumping, throwing, catching, hitting sports balls, hand to eye coordination, they're behind where they should be. And can you imagine how that makes a, 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 a kid feel in class? Yeah, in front of so their good. peers? Yeah. You know, the ball hits you in the eye when you go to catch it. It must be terrifying for a kid. Yeah. Yeah. So in effect, you know, everybody out in the green in the housing estate, my experience, that um, made up for what the, the, the issues in primary school PE. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Okay. For years. 
So into the adoles adolescence, and um, I'm going to play in a moment uh, Mickey Quinn, by the way, he was on OTBM this morning. He's a PE teacher, Longford footballer. I know you know uh, Mickey as well. So the and maybe you were part of this, maybe this is what you're referencing, the Irish Health Schools Fitness Challenge, um, 2017, 30,000 students in this instance. So they came up with lots of interesting data. Uh, one third, one third of 16-year-old girls, one third of 16-year-old girls do not meet the fitness levels that can prevent diseases. So we're not talking making the Olympics, we're talking preventing diseases. That's a third of girls by the age of 16. And for boys, it's two in five. Again, we're talking preventing diseases. Do you know the, what, what jumps out here is uh, for girls, uh, it's a third when they get to 16, it's only 8% to 12. So between the ages of 12 and 16 is when this thing explodes. Yeah, I, I have the data actually here in front of me. That, that is the work that we have done. Uh, and it is, you know, it's very, very clear that it's after the age of 14, 12 to 14, based on our 10 years of data, that particularly in boys, fitness levels improve at first year, second year, but then after third year, and we see the same, we see this drop off in sport at the same age, the fitness level in boys no longer continue to increase. The fitness level in girls, um, that does not change after first year. And actually we believe the girls who, who we are getting to participate in the school's fitness challenge in third and fourth year are probably those who are physically active. So we're getting actually a biased sample. It's not really a, a true reflection okay. you know, of, of where we are with girls. And their numbers so you, obviously- you mean, you mean the inactive girls are saying, sod that I'm not doing your survey? Correct, so therefore they're not, they're not in it. They, you know, okay. they, and you know, there are issues with girls in relation to you know, makeup and breathing hard. And you know, they just, they've, they've never felt this sensation and they say, this, this is not for me. I don't want to get engaged with that. And maybe we have to find a different way to assess them. It could be through a dancing activity and measuring their heart rate response to that. I think we have to be more innovative using virtual reality. There are different ways of doing this. But I think, yes, going back to, to, to what we found is that as the students go through secondary school, their cardiovascular fitness levels either remain constant for girls or decrease. And we find that the proportion who don't meet the minimum requirement to maintain optimal cardiovascular health, which means if you're below this fitness level, you're at increased risk of developing cardiovascular disease. That number increases. It can be up as high as 50, 60%. Okay. Uh, do we have any good, reliable data on why they're dropping out? Look, it's, 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 that's the, the, the million dollar question. Uh, it, that's a really, really difficult one. Yeah. And, you know, if you ask the majority of young girls in their 30s and women in their 30s and 40s, 50s, and you met them in the street and, and said to them, tell me about your experience in PE, it would be just so negative. I mean, really? my own yeah. wife told me yesterday about, you know, when she was in first year having to, you know, when she was developing and, you know, during that phase in her life and she having to jump over a pommel horse and she landed. She said she was so embarrassed, she dreaded physical education for the rest of her time in secondary school. And the whole idea of changing and, you know, no showers and all of these issues. So I think that's one part of the puzzle. The other thing is kids get to 15 years of age and if they have not been engaged, and I mean engaged in a meaningful way up until then, they get to 15 and they say, you know something, there's lots of other far more exciting things in life than playing some sport going out and some guy shouting at me, you know, I'm going to listen to music or I'll take up some other hobby. Mm. And that's what happens with many of them. Yeah. What we don't, you know, the top 10%, regardless of, of who coaches them, they're going to stay engaged in sport. You know, I laugh at this as though the coach is the person that the vast majority of, of, of the people who play sport in secondary school have always loved sport. The yeah. challenge, the real challenge. And when I see year after year, we, we compare our schools, these metrics for schools and who's the top school in the country. I always say, show me the school that takes the bottom 20% of kids academically and sporting wise and gets them engaged, gets them a junior cert or a leaving cert. They're the real success stories. It's easy to take a kid who's highly motivated. How do you take a young girl or boy at 15 years of age who has no interest, no family support and get them to be physically active? And particularly young girls who are arriving to school with notes, I think parents need to take a hard look at themselves because- As in, as in my daughter's not doing PE today. Correct. Yeah. Because you're saying, you're saying to that young daughter, we're going to make sure, or we're going to write a note that would allow you to be removed from probably the best 
form of medicine you could possibly get is physical activity because most kids will adapt their health behaviors when they're very, very young. Mm. So if, if parents continue to do that, what I would like the parents to do is this, write a note and saying, I bought my child uh, a headset and she's going to listen to music or a book and I'd love her to go for a 30 minute walk during PE. Could you facilitate that? Mm. And if that young girl walked those 30 minutes every day for the rest of her life, the health benefits would be incalculable. Yes, yes, it can't be just one size fits all. PE is, is is a really good point. Here's Mickey Quinn, by the way. So OTBM this morning, they were having a similar enough uh, chat. Mickey's obviously a Longford footballer and a secondary school PE teacher as well. Here's some what Mickey was saying this morning. I sat down last night and started to jot down a few points and, you know, half 12, one o'clock comes and you think, Jesus, I need to get to sleep here because you're passionate about it um, and that's why I... I I enjoy my job and I love it that you're passionate about uh, educating and the importance of it. Um, you know, there's such an importance placed on the leave insert um, that it's a defining moment in kids' futures or, or where they're heading in life. Whereas realistically, the, the six months or six years after the leave insert where people and, and teenagers realize that, hang on a minute, the habits, traits and skills that I've learned or put in place for the leave insert or around that time are what is going to live with me uh, for years to come. And that's why, as a PE teacher, for me, in my opinion and biased opinion at that, that physical education is the most important subject across the board, that if you don't have your health, you know, all those other things that come after it is, is secondary. And we're talking to Niall Moyna. If you've just tuned in, I'm sure you recognise the voice. So look, I mean, it, it sounds like, I mean, you can't but listen to you and somebody like Mickey this morning and be in any doubt as to the importance of this. I suspect at government level, they recognise it. You mentioned unions there being an obstacle. You mentioned various other issues floating around. I mean, you would hope we can make great strides very, very quickly if we all put our minds to it here. Well, I, I think probably one of the biggest impediments is our healthcare system because or i should say our disease care system because our healthcare is designed around acute acute illness care and that's the problem okay we spend three to five percent of our annual budget on preventive medicine it's spent you get sick you access the healthcare system we need a seismic shift a paradigm shift actually in how medicine is run in this country. Now, I know that there is going to be a big shift from the hospital to community-based uh, care of, of many of these acute illnesses because people don't have one chronic illness. They tend to have multiple chronic illnesses now. So it's this multi-morbidity. Mm -hmm. But I hope when it goes to the community, it's not going to be the same that we just end up being just polypharmacy but delivered in the community. We have probably the most wonderful drug on earth you know, which is exercise. In fact, if we could benefit, if we could package the known benefits of exercise in a pill, it would be the most prescribed wonder drug in the world. And yeah. I'll give you a simple, a simple example. We have a lot of people in this country go for stenting. Stenting for heart disease, you get, you get a blockage in your artery to put a stent in. That's a band-aid. That doesn't fix the problem. Mm -hmm. The same person goes out to walk. Their blood vessel remodels. It becomes healthy. You develop a healthy phenotype. Your heart remodels. So it, why? it's only after we get the heart attack in Ireland, then you go to cardiac rehab. Could we not go to cardiac prehab yeah. to stop it in the first place? If you look at our hospitals, go into a cardiac rehab, go into a, 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 any of the surgery clinics in Ireland. So go into the cath lab, multi-million dollars, millions of dollars spent. And look at the cardiac rehab in a hospital. It's stuck in some dingy corner in a little room. That's the problem. That's where lifestyle preventive medicine is in this country. Medicine is seen as you get sick and we give you a drug or a surgical intervention. We need to change that. Mm. That's the first thing. And the second thing is we need to focus on, prevent, on preventive medicine. And there's a, there's a cottage industry in Ireland on behavioral change. The hardest thing in the world to do is to change a behavior. Look at the thousands of diets in the world because none of them work. You're trying to change an ingrained behavior. Can adopting a healthy behavior not become the norm rather than try to change you know, a poor behavior, a poor habit later in life? So I think we need to get both of those. No, no, you can't have one without the other. Yes. Uh, to go from the adolescents into adults then, uh, we, we, the information I've seen is that of the 30 minutes per day, which we should all be getting, about a quarter of adults hit that minimum. 
So look, I mean, speaking as an adult, uh, here are the reasons. Look, I, I, I adore exercise. I love how it makes me feel. Uh, I am not in a great place if I go more than three, four days without it. However, however, uh, we're all time poor. Uh, team events are impossible with work and various things, and, and often team events are a great way to do it, but we are a bit time poor. And also connected with that, we're often wrecked. We're working hard, we're stressed. And it's not easy to muster the motivation to do some exercise. That's So that's there, there's some of the honest reasons why people don't do it. I don't know anyone. I don't know anyone who wouldn't like to exercise more. So it's really hard to do. And it's also uh, difficult given lifestyles and everything else. So look, these are just some of the things you're facing. Yeah, I mean, and I would say, Joe, yours is a biased perspective because you're talking from the perspective of a guy that likes exercise. There are lots of people who don't like exercise. Oh, so, and so, sorry, plenty of times, don't get me wrong, there's plenty of times I'm sitting at the couch saying, I'm an hour here, I should really go for a run. And my brain says, it's hard though. It's going yeah. to be hard. So I love it and I love how I feel afterwards, but don't get me wrong, it's painful, it's uncomfortable. It's It takes motivation to do it. Yeah, I, I think it comes back again to this perception of fitness and what I need for health. Okay. You know, the key message I would like to get from this interview is that every bout of exercise counts, regardless of how short it is. If it's just two minutes, it's the sitting that's causing the, the prolonged periods of sitting. So no one should sit for more than 20 to 25 minutes without getting up for at least a minute. And research shows that that simple getting up, walking up a flight of stairs, walking to, to the bathroom, whatever the case may be, that makes a difference. And, you know, obviously we are time poor, but if we can't, it's only the day you get the diagnosis, you say, oh, if only. Sure. But it's something that we have control over. And for the people who can't get the 30 minutes a day, and that's the problem because we set this target of, and I should say the guidelines have now changed. It was 30 minutes a day. That's the ideal. But now they're saying, and I've been preaching this for years, if you can only do 10 minutes a day, but did it every single day of the year, that is much, much, much better than doing nothing. It's the doing nothing is the problem. So if it's 10, 15 minutes, or maybe every second day, make the effort to walk five minutes from your front door and five minutes back. Okay. I, and look, I think 15 minutes is 1% of your day. So like, geez, we can all make that time for ourselves. So I'm, I'm coming to a question here, but give me those four areas of fitness again. Cardiovascular, balance. Cardi which is your heart and lungs. Yeah. Muscular strength and endurance. Which is uh, your, your, your weights. Yes, yeah, okay. you're, you're, you're maintaining muscle mass. Yeah, balance third, was another. The third one then is ideal body weight. Okay, I'm particularly not carrying obesity, but not carrying a lot of excess weight in our midsection. Yeah. And then the fourth one is is balance. Okay, okay. So those four are what should we, we should all have in mind. If you're just tuning in, we talked about this more at the start of the interview. So, and you also gave some markers when it came to general fitness, uh, which are important. It strikes me, it's not... It's really not unachievable to get over that line where you prevent a bunch of diseases. You know, if you can just, it's really, it doesn't sound like it's a crazy demand on any of us to get to that point whereby your chances of having these diseases in later life drop dramatically. That's the kind of good news out of this, isn't it? Without a doubt. I mean, we are living to around females 82, males 80 years of age in Ireland, but that's our lifespan. But the problem is our health span is being reduced dramatically. That is the years of life that we live with good health. So the vast majority of people in Ireland will live probably the last 30 years of their life with at least one chronic chronic disease, if not more, mm. and they'll be on polypharmacy. I, in, a, in an ideal world, what we all like to do is live to 82 and compress our ill health into the last six months of our life. Right now, it's into the last 30 years, and the current generation of kids, for many of those, it'll be 40, 50 years, they will live you know, on multiple medications, undergoing surgery because of lifestyle. And the issue is that does not have to be. And you hit the nail in the head. We can change it through small changes. And you don't have to be in the top five, the top 10%. If you're above average, it dramatically, dramatically reduces your risk for developing these chronic diseases like high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, and even some forms of cancer and dementia. The vast, so many of those can be prevented. And think in the long term, the billions that we would save. Imagine using those billions for palliative care at the end of life and also for preventive medicine. And that's why I think we need a paradigm shift 
in our in, in, in our outlook to what we perceive health to be because it's a disease-based model of disease care and not a health-based model of health care at the moment. Okay, okay. Final and I point. should say, yeah, there yes, are, sorry, I should say, look, there are wonderful people in public health doing tremendous work. There's yes. absolutely no doubt about that. But I would like to see the government taking, being much more proactive and really spending money on preventive medicine. Now, each government is elected on a five-year promises, and you, you won't see the rewards in your term. You won't see the rewards for a generation. Well, but you, know, you, you, you know how we measure health? The trolley count. Yeah. That's how you're judged. So uh, this has to start at school. I mean, give me the, give the Jesuits, give me the boy, and I'll give you the man. Uh, in terms of our school system, is there, a, is there a, a country that gets this right, that gets that hour every day, that, that you know, develops all the motor skills, that is you know, delivering a 12-year-old and then six years later through, through uh, Leaving Cert, a young adult who has a good grounding in those four areas of fitness and can look after themselves and they're in decent shape you know, to live the next 30, 40 years? Who, who are you looking at and where, where do we compare? Well, Scandinavia seems to be the model, yeah. um, and they, it seems to be a, a large investment by their government, you know, on preventive services as well. You know, okay. it's embedded, you know, a healthy lifestyle is embedded. Now, you know, as I said earlier on, you know, we have spent very little. Look at the infrastructure. They want people to go out and cycle, you know, and cycle, and all of a sudden it ends, you know, and it's, it's, that's it. <laughs> you know, you're, you're on the road again. Yeah. You know, the, the, that, you know, to be fair, we're, we're trying to change that. Yeah. Uh, but we're trying to re-engineer our environment, and the environment is a big issue. And the reason I take up Scandinavia, they have much harsher winters than we have, and they have still managed to do it. And it's not always about money. You just have to look at the... I lived in the States for a long time, and, you know, obesity is an insidious disease it just was developing around me and i just the only time you would notice it you come back to america from ireland and you arrive at the airport you say oh my god am i on a different planet here yeah. but we're seeing something very very similar in ireland so i think there there are good models there's no there's no one society getting it a hundred percent right the rate of change in society has been so it's been exponential compared to any generation. Look at the amount of change within a year. The number of publications now in a year is probably 10 times what it was even five years ago. So the rate of change, the transformation, the digital, the digital age, we have to figure out how we're going to live within this. Our genes haven't changed. So think about it. The whole digital revolution has totally and utterly turned society upside down. Mm -hmm. We still have primarily the genes that we inherited 2 million, 4 million years ago. And those genes haven't changed and they still require us to be physically active. Okay, well, listen, we've taken up enough of your time. Professor Niall Moyner from DCU, uh, loads in that chat. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Joe.